joining us from the Bible Project, what a pleasure to have Tim Mackey, Jonathan Collins. Thank you guys so much for your time. Thanks for having us. Yeah, good to be here. Tell us how you guys got connected around the subject of the Bible. What brought you guys together? Yeah, we met in undergrad at a at a Bible school. We were both studying Bible. We we were both working at a skateboard outreach ministry together. Um, that was kind of loosely associated with this Bible school. It was right across the street, and we lived in the same house that housed all the like people who ran the skate church ministry and got to know each other there. Uh, Tim went on to just continue to study the Bible for <laughs> another <laughs> decade or more. <laughs> Far too long and loving every minute of it, though. Yeah. And, uh, and I went on to get into uh, marketing and um, learning how to really make explainer videos for the, for the advertising world. And then we reconverged about seven or eight years ago. Kind of Tim was moving back to Portland. We just have always had really great conversations around the Bible. Tim's mm. the kind of guy that I always felt really comfortable bringing my, my skepticism to, my darkest questions my uh, my kind of annoying, persistent um, que- question asking, and he <laughs> always helped guide me into really interesting questions mm-hmm. and uh, really helped the Bible come to life in ways that I just was like, this is this is amazing. Let's keep doing this. Um, and with my background with explainer videos, thought that would be a cool idea to make these biblical theology animations. And you, you, I mean, you're certainly not the only one who would ever have questioned the Bible or been curious about what it all means, found it confusing and these sorts of things. For you, Tim, like you said, you studied it for so long. What was it that appealed to you about the Bible? Because for so many, so many of us, it can seem like this ancient, archaic book that sits dusty on a bookshelf. Why was it appealing yeah. to you? You know, I, I didn't read the Bible much at all growing up. Yeah, um, my parents were followers of Jesus, but they didn't um, impose or press it on us very much. And so I was really coming to the Bible brand new. I was uh, decided to follow Jesus in my early 20s. So I had a community around me um, that, that that supported and encouraged us to follow Jesus and to somehow root following Jesus in mm. the set of texts and in these stories. So that was one motivator. It wasn't intellectual. It was communal. Um, and then another aspect of it was uh, I, I signed up for classes at, at Multnomah Bible College that John was talking about. And I was just had the fortune of having some professors that just blew my mind. And I mean, I had no college aspirations even when I signed up for classes at mm. this college. And so uh I barely graduated from high school. And so, but for me, it was just like, all I'm learning about the beauty of literature, poetry. Uh, so these professors introduced me to the literary artistry and brilliance of biblical narrative and poetry. And I was just hooked. I just thought it was the most beautiful, exciting, stimulating literature I'd ever read. Mm. So I, I never had a phase where the Bible was boring. <laughs> uh, for me, it's been exciting, new uh, country to discover for a couple decades now. Mm. So I, n- I now sympathize with people who, who find it hard <laughs> to understand. And I was confused mm. and still am about lots of things. But I-, I found more answers to questions the longer I sit with and understand what the Bible is communicating on its own, own terms when we read mm. it the way it's designed to be read. Well, and the more you read it, I suppose, the more you get out of it. You so you often hear Christians, people who've read the Bible, saying that they see things new every single time they take a look at it. But I know in Portland, Oregon, this may be the case here in Australia, it is, where Christianity, the teachings of the Bible, they're not necessarily so central to our society in ways that they maybe once were. Why do you mm. think the teachings of the Bible, even the person of Jesus, is still relevant to today in a world that doesn't necessarily embrace Christian ideas? Well, at its core, the biblical story is addressing the things that everybody is thinking about all the time anyway. (laughs) Uh, Where are we? Who are we? Um, Is there a problem? And if there is a problem, what exactly is the problem or set of problems? And are there any solutions? And um, at what point are we in the problem to solution storyline? 
Um, and now I'm, that's just actually a kind of silly list to say out loud like that. <laughs> but every single human being is getting up out of bed and operating, whether they know it or not, on a set of answers to those questions that they've mm. either worked out consciously or that they've received uh, from some authority source around them. And so that's what the Bible's about. Um, its own story is about how God appointed humans to be his partners in ruling the world. And in a million ways, the Bible explores how we have fouled up the job. And the story leads to Jesus, uh, who claims and accomplished um, an ultimate act of love and leadership uh, and claims to be the king of the world, teaching us how to be God's partners in ruling the world. And um, that's a story that wraps itself around the whole human experience and all of its complexity, politics, religion, economics, family, relationships. Mm. And some of what brings its messages to life is what you're doing, John, with these brilliant videos through the animation studio that's part of the Bible Project. Over 200 million or so views on YouTube on a number of different channels, people checking out what you are creating. The characters and the ideas that you're talking about are ones of, of people that live in very different contexts to what we do in the modern world. There's such an agricultural theme to a lot of the lives, particularly of many characters in the Bible. How do you take their stories and make them matter for people who live in lives that are so different from some of those characters? One tool that we use to help the Bible stay, I suppose, relevant, or, but without turning it into something it's not, is by looking at um, the biblical themes. These are motifs that trace themselves all the way through the whole collection of, of literature that we know as the Bible, which is, which is a number of different uh, types of books written in different genres over many different times in human history by many different authors. But all of them, like Tim was saying, are, are working out a, a core set of ideas through one central storyline. And to tie it all together are, are these themes. And so these themes are things like, um, what, is it, what does it mean to be the image of God, uh, being God's royal partners? That's a theme that, that travels, it starts at the beginning of the Bible and travels all the way through and has its climax in Jesus. Um, what does it mean that uh, heaven and earth are supposed to be one, but we live in this time where, uh, where they're separated in some way? What does it mean that we're exiles? These, so these biblical themes, uh, I think, uh, allow us to come to the Bible on its own terms, see the kind of artistry of how the authors are developing these themes and thinking through them. But then there, are, you just you see it, you smell it, you sense it immediately. This is this is a this is applicable to me um, in my context. Uh, sometimes we end a video with more of a modern context, um, but. Uh, but we also are not trying to be prescriptive mm. in what you do with these ideas. And, um, and it, it just doesn't take much of an imagination to then connect the dots to, to your own circumstance. What are some of the characters of the Bible that you guys find most interesting or maybe that you've connected with in a way where you think their story is just so relevant to now? Mm. Uh, for me, it's whatever one I happen to be studying <laughs> for the project that I'm working on. <laughs> So right now I'm like immersed in the Abraham stories for a project that I'm doing. And I'm just, uh, both he and his wife, Sarah, it's uncanny, man. It's a couple that God wants to give the world to, but they keep um, thinking that they have to scheme up their own plans to gain security and the good life. And in their attempts to get the good life by their own wisdom, they hurt themselves and all the people around them. Mm. <laughs> and then God has to like get involved in their messes and it puts God in some very awkward situations because he made a promise to these people but they're actually even more terrible than some of the people around them so it again like John was saying once you begin to see the themes working out in any given character story you're like this is my life and my <laughs> friend and it just doesn't take that much imagination it's just learning to cross that cultural gap and mm. learning how to read literature or somebody's story who lives from a culture that's different than mine. But, but we do that all the time. When you read novels or stories, even children's literature mm. often takes place in worlds or cultures that are different than my own. And it's just learning 
it's a, it's a cultural exchange that's happening when we read the Bible. It's a cross-cultural experience to mm. open up your Bible. And John, you mentioned that you've at times had so many big questions. You've asked a lot about the Bible, perhaps its meaning to your own life. What was it that made you sort of step over and realize that the Bible actually did have value to your own life, that it wasn't just a text to question from a distance? I think the biggest shift was I thought the Bible was a handbook um, that taught me how to get into heaven when I die. That was my paradigm. And what I've come to realize in this project is the Bible is about so many things, but actually it's not about that. That the story of going to heaven when you die is, pretty, is absent from the Bible. It's the story of heaven coming to earth um, and heaven and earth uniting. Um, and central to that theme is what Tim's already alluded to, which is that humans have this calling to be God's image, his, his royal ruling partners on earth. And so all of a sudden, seeing the biblical story through that lens, not let me bide my time until I can zap out of here, <laughs> but, um, but the story is I have to learn how to rule because mm. what God wants of me is to steward creation and to expand the blessing of God's goodness throughout creation here and now. And um, that, that was a massive shift for me. Um, another massive shift that just helped unlock the Bible in terms of um, how I read it and how I could approach it was I really thought um, that the Bible was merely a, merely a divine book. I grew up in a tradition that would say the Bible is both human and divine. That's mm. an orthodox position. But then we would kind of tense up a little bit and be like, but really, it's just divine. Like we would, we would be scared to see any human fingerprints mm. on the Bible. And, when, and in this project, working with Tim, we're constantly talking about the Bible as literature. And at first, I really cringed whenever Tim would talk about it as literature because literature is a human thing. Um, and con de looking at the literary devices and, and the literary approach made me think like we're, we're taking God out of the Bible. Hmm. But actually what I found was by allowing the Bible to be literature and approaching it that way, it actually opened it up for me. And, and the divinity of the Bible started exploding out in new ways that couldn't be contained anymore. Yeah, that, that relationship between the divine and the human, that maybe applies to this question a little bit because one thing that I've always found curious is that unlike other books, unlike other famous pieces of poetry literature, when you read the Bible and if you've ever listened to any church sermon, there's this inherent belief that we're meant to take what's in the Bible, whether it's the stories of some of the characters or individual scriptures, and apply them to our lives. We're meant to learn three points about why they matter now, or even some of the scriptures are taken as promises, invitations to trust God. He'll guide and direct your steps. We take it very personally and we see it as kind of a mantra, if you want to put it that way, that we're meant to live by. Why do you think we do that with the Bible in a way that maybe we don't do with other books? Because when you watch a movie, you don't think, okay, I've got to live by everything it's telling me. Why do we see the Bible as something that is instructional and that carries promises from God for our lives? Yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, w one angle to approach that question is, um, wh why do I even care about this set of ancient Jewish texts? Well, it's actually not a given that anybody should care about them. <laughs> um, but if somebody uh, is uh, wants to follow Jesus, um, then at some point you have to reckon with the fact that he cared deeply about these texts and actually gave birth to a whole new collection of them called the writings of his closest followers, the apostles, what Christians call the New Testament. Um, so if you read the stories about Jesus, and want to follow him, you won't take very long before you realize he really cares about this set of texts that here I have in this book called the Old Testament. He's constantly quoting from it, explaining who he is and why he's doing what he's doing in light of uh, the, these texts. And he it's clear that he reads and understands his world and who he is in light of this bigger drama. Mm. I think it, these texts, and Jesus clearly assumes that these texts are designed to shape how we think about the world, um, how we live in it, and much, even more, to connect us to the living God. 
But the way that we often get the Bible to do those things, I think, uh, c can be really unhelpful. And, and not to target what you're saying, but just the idea that the Bible has principles and truths that I apply to my life, I think can perpetuate like a, a moral handbook, mm. kind of a, a way of approaching the Bible. Like, what does God want me to believe? Or how does he want God want me to behave? And where's the page and the sentence on the page where I find that answer to that question? And the Bible doesn't present itself like that. It presents mm. itself more how Jesus saw it and talked about it, which is as an epic drama explored in narrative and poetry and riddles and letters. And um, the reason followers of Jesus accept it as a form of divine guidance um, is because we see ourselves as living within that same story. And so if we're going to live out faithfully what it means to follow Jesus, mm. I need to know the story. <laughs> uh, and because it will look different in different cultural times and in places mm. and that's a process that began with uh the moment that the jesus movement spread out of jerusalem was his followers discovering how to live faithfully and consistently in light of the story mm. so that's uh, that's how i would kind of frame up uh a response to that question and that's kind of what we're after with bible project resources is to help people learn the story and how to live in the story yeah it's a really helpful perspective that you offer and i think maybe it shows why some people get so annoyed with the Bible because it's not laid out like a handbook. You can't go to the chapter on racial injustice, for instance, and specifically see how God would say to respond to specific situations. And maybe that's why the Bible is so timeless, because it doesn't have such a specific instructional. But when you are thinking of issues that we face in modern times, whether it is racial injustice, whether it's how Christians should approach the conversation of euthanasia or IVF or any of these big things. Some of us wish we could just go to page 380 and find the answer. How do you think the Bible helps us wrestle with some of those things in light of that narrative where it is just one big story? Um, there's a really cool story in the book of Acts where um, uh, the Jesus movement has crossed this ethnic boundary, which is where God has been making this covenant with Israel. And in that covenant with Israel, there actually was a, a lot of, a list of rules, um, very clear guidelines. Here's how you should live. And we, ha and we have those. We have 613 of them in, in the Torah. Um, and it's not a complete list. And it's not a list that we could even try to follow if you wanted to try to follow. Um, but it helped make this covenant with Israel that God was doing something with the blessed the whole world. So Jesus fulfills that. He saw himself as the fulfillment of that story. And he says, now let's go to all the nations and, and bring bring this story to its fulfillment. And uh, to do that, it had to cross this ethnic boundary line. And some of these Jewish customs, like circumcision, um, Sabbath observance, but specifically kosher meals, eating kosher, um, all of a sudden became a bit of a hindrance. And so you get the story of um, the, uh, the early Jesus followers getting together, praying, reading the Bible, and asking the Holy Spirit to help them figure this out. Hmm. And then they said, Also okay. arguing. They have a big argument. <laughs> and they have a big argument. <laughs> Always. <laughs> um, and, and this is a cool story because uh, there's lots of, of these issues now coming around the corner that the Bible was not trying to address. Like, it, it, uh, you know, even, even these, these issues um, that you, you, the issues that you mentioned were great. Um, and so we need to get together. We need to read our Bible because it does bring us wisdom. We get to see, for example, that um, all human life is dignified and worthy of protection. Um, we and and care. We get to see how much God cares for the oppressed and marginalized. And we get to see these foundational things, but then we have to figure out and argue and ask the Holy Spirit to help us figure out what does that mean for this time in human history and the mm. context we're in. Do you think that's because he's trying to create relationship with us? Like he gives us themes, <laughs> but if you want the details, you got to talk to him? Uh, for, for sure, um, among many things. Um, but, but the way that you talk to him is through a community of people who's discerning God's will, both by studying the story, but then also by uh, living out the story and seeing what the spirit is saying through the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And that's what's happening in that story in the book of Acts. 
And I think it gives, it provides a pattern. Um, the, the, a, a single book couldn't ever provide comprehensive guidance for every human, every place and any time. That's not possible. Um, but uh, the work of, but a story can set your moral compass mm. and get you going towards true north with core convictions about who humans are, what we're here for, what's good, what's not good, who God is. And if you get a group of people who are, who are operating and living by Jesus' teachings, uh, doing that, you've got you've got the invention of hospitals, the invention of the orphanage, for example, mm, right? Yeah. The invention of the printing press. Um, Universities. I mean, we're like ma major, major uh, accomplishments uh, in human history. Um, the civil rights movement here in the United States, for mm. example, uh, dedicated followers of Jesus. So that's what that's in my mind. That's that's how it works. Mm, <laughs> so yeah. not in my mind. How, that's how I see it working in the Bible, and that seems to be how it's worked. Right? Uh, yeah, these very tangible things become expressions of some of those like biblical concepts. And whenever you read about what you guys are doing with the Bible Project, there's this phrase that keeps coming up that you look at the Bible as this unified story that leads us to Jesus. And I feel like that word unified is what really pops. Why is that something that is so important to you guys, creating something that makes that connection? Well, in John and I's experience, um, both just being followers of Jesus and church ministry, we've noticed that some of the main ways people interact with the Bible is like a reference book. Um, you know, find the page in the sentence and what am I supposed to believe and do? And so with that unified story tagline for the Bible Project, um, we're trying to just reorient people to how the Bible actually presents itself which is as an epic narrative. Lots of different parts and pieces and books, but it's a unified story. And if you read a story the way it's designed to be read, then it can do its work on you. Um, it's actually not a lot different than uh, I've little boys and um, you know when they first uh, were could get into my tool shed, uh, my older son started using my hammer as a shovel in the backyard. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, and it worked. He could make the little claw on the backside, like dig. It was really effective, actually. But of course, that's not what it's designed to do. Mm. And to be honest, I think that's how a lot of Christians, with knowing it or not, relate to the Bible. We make it do things uh, that it's either not designed to do, or it actually is designed to do them, but we just are using the wrong tools to make it do that thing. Mm. And so the unified story is kind of our way of helping people reorient to how the Bible hangs together as a unified work. That is such a helpful picture. And I love the idea of your son doing that. Full props to him for creativity and, and ingenuity. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> for, for Christians, the Bible is meant to be this thing that does set the framework for what we believe, how we live our lives. But like many of the people that reach out to the Bible Project, we can find it hard to actually read and understand. So what is your both of your guys' advice on how to read the Bible. How do we do it and draw meaning from it effectively? Yeah, and I'll say that it's still hard. I grew up reading the Bible. I went to school, got a degree in reading the Bible, and I've spent the last seven years talking about the Bible with Dr. Tim Mackey. And I'll, I'll open up the Bible and it's still really hard. Um, uh, we have a series of videos on how to read the Bible, and, and we go through the three main literary genres. So you kind of have to be aware of what, what type of literature am I reading? Is it narrative? Is it poetry? Or is it prose discourse? You'll find all three of those in the Bible, and, and they all communicate in different ways. Just like you wouldn't go to the newspaper and read a news article the same way you would go to a children's book and read a children's story. Um, or you wouldn't read the back of a cereal box the same way you um, read a novel. Um, and uh, so that, that's, a, that's a big thing to do. Um, we also, you know, not just to plug our work, but, it, but Tim's made these really great overviews of each book of the Bible that gives you like the, the, the structure of how the book is designed. And so it's, it's kind of like a roadmap, so you don't get as lost. So you're not like in... Ezekiel chapter 33, reading like whatever next epic 
prophetic apocalyptic poem and all of a sudden you're like, I have no <laughs> idea where I'm at. You can kind of step back and get your bearings. Um, uh, but uh, I would say the, the biggest thing is read it in community. Mm. Um, I think in my tradition, there was this real impetus to do your quiet time by yourself and make reading your Bible a solo sport. And in the early Christian communities, um, you know, not everyone had their own Bible. And, um, and even in, in the early Jewish communities, you, you would come together and, and you would read it aloud together. You listen to it and then and you talk about it. So, so make it a team sport. Um, read the Bible with, with people. Re- read the Bible with people who maybe have a, a bit of an insight into some of the original languages or maybe have some more, done some more work than you. Um, uh, but whoever you have uh, along with you in life, um, make it make it a team sport. Tim, did you have anything you wanted to add to that on how to read the Bible? Um, yeah, maybe just one one thing. And uh, for me, this has been the most exciting kind of new frontier for me in the last few years is the way, even though there's a lot of books like just in the Old Testament, um, it, it actually is unified in terms of all these diverse texts have been brought together over a long period of time. But it's sort of like a cake that has lots of different ingredients or sections, but there's been an icing layer put onto it to hold the whole thing together. And the icing that holds it all together is actually given to you in the first 11 pages of the first book of the Hebrew Bible. Um, it's called Genesis chapters 1 through 11. and they're some of the most well-known and most misunderstood stories of the Bible. But there's something going on in those 11 pages that if you get the themes and the, the patterns of repetition, the rest of the biblical story is just working out the themes and ideas of those first 11 pages. Mm. Um, and even all the way up, including into the New Testament, the story of Jesus is set to the melody of those pages of Genesis. And so... Um, reading the Bible and expecting it to be more like a symphony where you hear the opening melody in the first like you know 30 seconds and then the rest of the symphony is just working out those notes and it'll highlight an instrument here and like that Um, and the Bible is much more like like a symphony and so it doesn't read like modern narratives or Mm. novels on fiction it's its own kind of literature and if you can begin to hang with that you, uh, your understanding can really begin to increase. Both of your answers have just been so helpful. The everyday Christian, whatever that looks like and means, the everyday <laughs> Christian who is trying to be more like Jesus and live in his footsteps, our modern world is so distracting. There is so much going on that can easily pull us away from that commitment. You guys have obviously both been able to make the Bible and your faith part of your job. And I imagine that has its own challenges, but for the person who is living in whatever circumstance, whatever endeavor they may be, and they want to live as a Christian, how do you think they can can do it well and try and eliminate some of the things that can distract and can pull them away from this core philosophy they're trying to guide their life by? Well, maybe one way of thinking about it is You know, the the kind of calling that Jesus placed on his disciples wasn't so much to do a separate thing than live and do the business of life. It was a calling to do the business of life in a new way, in a new story with a different imagination. And so um, for for most Christians throughout history who don't get paid to be Christians, it's a matter of just being a human uh, and doing it, doing with God's wisdom and uh, in light of the love and the story of Jesus, whatever it is that the circumstances I find myself in. It's not a separate thing. Life is the, the place where you do the stuff called following Jesus. Mm. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I don't know. That, that's just the first thing that, that, that occurs to me. And so... Um, every generation of the human family has had its own challenges and opportunities unique to their place and time. And the modern world's no different. We just happen to be living right now. So, you know, we've got these devices that are like melting our brain and, um, you know, making us the most distracted 
humans <laughs> who can't focus on anything for more than 10 seconds. And so that's a problem. But I, you know, I, I don't actually think it takes that much wisdom to know what to do. Mm. Um, I think it's more just difficult because we don't want to get rid of these things or exercise our willpower over them. But um, it seems to me that we ought to. <laughs> yeah, that's a whole that's a whole conversation <laughs> that we probably need to be thinking about. And totally. providing guidance, right? So anyway. Yeah, um, John, did you have any thoughts on that? How to be kind of an undistracted follower of Jesus? <laughs> Uh, you know, I, I do not pretend to, to live an undistracted life. Um, but as I was thinking about that question and as it pertains to your previous question and how to read the Bible well, um, there, there, there's a lot to be gained by just going and and reading Jesus's words and the stories about Jesus and starting there. Um, and every piece of media we touch is telling us a story about Mm. who you are, why you're important, um, why any of this exists and matters. And, um, and, and, and the better it's doing it kind of the more sneaky it is and you don't realize it's doing it. And the Bible Mm. is no different. And, um, and so, uh, giving yourself enough time to just sit with Jesus's words, and then by starting with Jesus, then realizing he sees himself as a fulfillment of this whole other thing, then that can become your gateway into the rest of the literature, which is the Bible. Mm. And you guys have created stories that point people to Jesus in a way that, and I guess in a way that uses platforms that are normally used for bits of content that don't necessarily have a whole bunch of meaning to them. I mean, YouTube at the time where you guys first joined it was really there was lots of gimmicks, lots of like funniest home video style stuff, the cat videos, all of it. You guys have used these platforms that while, like you said, Tim, they can distract us. We need to not let them melt our brains. They also have such opportunity to get meaningful messages to a mass audience. How have you guys found a way to create content that is deeper, but that still resonates with people that clocks up those views, clocks up those connections? Well, I think I think there's two things. One is we're we're looking at the story of the Bible, and the story of the Bible is is amazing literature, and of course it's going to allow us to explore amazing ideas, um, and so that is <laughs> incredibly helpful. But I would say the second thing is is the crowdfunding model that we have um, allows allows it. Like if you're a normal YouTuber. Um, you've got to get millions of views and you got to do it on a budget. Um, and uh, we get to spend a good amount of money and time making stuff that's really, uh, I'm really proud of. It's really beautiful and um, you wouldn't find it on YouTube most of the time and usually people would have to charge for it. And so I think we get away with it largely because of the generosity of people who are saying, I want this to exist for people. And mm. we've just been really grateful for that. One um, thing that John probably won't talk about it Um, because he's humble, but um, he, while I was going to school for too long, he was actually developing employable skills uh, (laughs) in marketing and storytelling. And, you know, he happened upon this medium of the short explainer video. And it really is a unique, it's its own art Hmm. of of an explanation, educational medium. And so John really, it's both his temperament, but through practice, honed the skill of getting into the details of an idea, finding the core and the essence of the ideas, and then distilling it and writing about it in simple language in a way that you can talk about it in about five minutes. Mm. And there's something about seeing something explained visually, hearing a simple explanation in normal language, that it does something to our memories and our, our brains in a, that's really unique. It's different than reading a book, different than hearing a lecture. So um, I have learned about this medium and how to explain things by working with John. But it, YouTube is the ideal platform for that. Mm-hmm. And YouTube will change and develop. And the way that we do this will have to change and develop to one day. But for this time, the medium of the short explainer, animated explainer video was just the perfect vehicle for the mm. stuff that John and I wanted to explore and share with other people. Yeah, so you- it's kind of, in that sense, it's a very providential 
thing that we couldn't necessarily have planned. It's just what has happened. Yeah, you guys and your team have done such an incredible job. And as we do wrap up, I just want to say thank you guys so much for your time, for your expertise. Is there anything that either of you would like to add before we before we say our goodbyes? I love that people in Australia are following the project. We've got a lot of uh, fans and patrons and audience members, and we're just really appreciative of that and um, uh, excited to um, see that see that grow. My final, I don't know, statement would be um, Jesus is more beautiful and compelling, and the Bible is more sophisticated and uh, and beautiful and compelling than, than most of us ever realized and assume. And when we can allow it to be what it actually is made to be, I get ready for perpetual surprise. <laughs> so well said. Tim, thank you guys. John, thank you for your time. You guys enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Totally.